Welcome back to Better Together. Man, this is session three on our study in biblical community. And today we're talking about belonging together. We've talked about in the first session one, loving well and understanding that that's really the, the foundation for good biblical community. Last uh, week, we talked about what it means to reach out together. And we're better together when we reach out. And today we want to talk about, man, how we're better together when we belong with each other. Uh, I personally love cop shows. My wife and I, one of the, the shows that we like watching and kind of old school is NCIS. I mean, you may be there. Or, um, and the new rendition, it's a series called Lethal Weapon. Sometimes that's fun or Hawaii Five-0. Man, I, I like the rookie. Okay, why am I saying all that? Because in cop shows, they always have that backup. And matter of fact, good police shows, they always have a partner. And the truth is, uh, this, this Christian life was never intended for us to be alone, that God wants us to partner with one another. And that's so important that we recognize that. We need to have each other's back. Um, matter of fact, in scripture, you'll find 56 different kinds of one another, like love one another, um, serve one another, be at peace with one another, stir up one another. Um, you'll find that 56 times in scripture. Uh, we're not just believers, we are belongers. And I love what Ecclesiastes chapter four, verse nine says, two are better than one because they have a good return for their work. If one falls down, his friend can help him up. But pity the man who falls and has no one to help him up. Though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves. A cord of three strands is not quickly broken. See, it means we not only need each other, but we're better together. Uh, I want you to check out John chapter 13, the Gospel of John chapter 13, verses 34 and 35. A new command I give you. This is Jesus talking. Love one another as I have loved you. So you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples. If, it's like a stipulation, if, they're, they're gonna know you're my disciples if you love one another. The number one characteristic of a follower of Jesus is their love for the other followers of Jesus. It's their love for one another. Uh, and the word in the New Testament used to describe this is fellowship. The Greek word is koinonia. In studies, man, if you dive into this, you'll find that um, this is crucial for any healthy church. As a matter of fact, um, studies that I believe Barna have, has done shows that it's the loving churches, it's the churches where there is a sense of welcoming and community that actually grow. They are first and foremost a loving church, that people are actually and generally in love with each other. It's not manufactured, they're experiencing spiritual growth on a journey together and it creates energy and it's a dynamic that quite honestly you're never gonna get from hanging out at a bar or just having secular friendships. It's something the Holy Spirit does. There's a binding and uniting that the Holy Spirit does with God's people and His family. Now, for the rest of our teaching time together uh, in this Connect group, I want us to dive in to verse seven from 1 Corinthians chapter 13. And we're just gonna look at that one verse and then make some conclusions here, some observations, some lessons we can learn about love. Uh, and here's what verse seven, says, it, talking about love, love always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. I mean, right there, I love this because it gives us some really simple lessons on love. Here's what we know about love. Love always protects. Uh, we protect people with our prayers. We, we protect people by keeping confidence. We protect people by when they share something with us, we listen and we engage them and we let them know we heard what they said. We, we protect each other by caring enough for one another that we don't share the details and the vulnerabilities of others with those who aren't part of that communication. Matter of fact, I would tell you right now, one of the chief ways the devil destroys biblical community is through a thing called gossip. Proverbs chapter 11, verse 13 says, a gossip betrays a confidence, but a trustworthy man keeps a secret. Uh, if we're to understand biblical community, and we're gonna start by loving those in our connect group, 
then look for ways to protect the confidence in the connect group. Look for ways to be that kind of person that you can be trusted by what others tell you. You know, can you keep a secret? I hope so. I hope so. Because that word protect in the Greek and the original language literally means, and this is a fill in the blank for you, protect means to cover, to keep off something which threatens. Uh, hold out against. Uh, it's this idea of, of throwing your body in front of, uh, of something that could cause harm to the person that you're protecting and trying to shield. And the truth is we live in a culture that actually likes to use others' weaknesses and break trust. It uses sensationalism to uh, make something exciting. Uh, people love the juicy stuff and all the, the exaggerated and hyperbole stories of other people's lives, but, but God's people aren't to be that way. God's people need to be a people that model His love and His love protects. It looks for ways to shield uh, our church from gossip and we don't let other people speak poorly of those in our church. See, gossip is you or I talking to someone who's not part of the solution or the problem. And God hates gossip. Do you know that? God literally hates gossip. We may be temporarily making ourselves feel better by talking about someone else's situation and we feel better at, at their expense, but the truth is it will always come back to haunt you. Uh, God puts gossip in the same list as murder. I mean, why? Because I believe gossip destroys community. Gossip tears down a small group. It destroys a church. It, it destroys biblical community. Um, it's incredibly destructive, destructive because it breaks trust. Love, on the other hand, has an enduring, qual an enduring quality under pressure. It protects those who are under attack. And so when all that's raining down in this world is coming at you and at those in your church, God wants to use you to be that umbrella to shield people. Um, and let me just say this, if you're someone who, is, listen, we've grown up in a culture that almost not only enjoys gossip, but, but uh, pays for it. So if you're someone who finds yourself, there's a tendency to sometimes not keep confidence or you, you do find yourself talking about other people's issues, just know this, that, that gossip is something that God wants to root out of your life. And if you pass, let me, let me put it this way. If you were to pass on stolen goods, you could be taken to court and actually found guilty as an accessory to theft. Well, if you pass on gossip, you're as guilty as the person who started it. So don't put up with gossip. Have a low threshold when it comes to that. And if you're not certain, then just say, hey, I'm a little awkward with us talking about such and such. I mean, be that person who, who creates some clear boundary lines to protect those in the body of Christ. And believe me, if people can sense that about you, they're more likely to want to talk to you and share stuff with you. So uh, what's the number one thing? The first thing is this, love always protects. Here's the second thing we learned from that verse. Love always, write this down, trust. This is a trust that believes in the goodness of someone. Uh, there's so much cynicalness today, but let's, let's believe the best, man. Matter of fact, here's some fill in the blanks for you. We believe in each other, and here's your next fill in the blank. We believe for each other. Sometimes people get stereotyped as gullible, but you know, maybe they're just more loving and more selective about choosing to believe the best. I mean, love clears the slate and works hard to give someone the benefit of doubt. Uh, I'm taking you at your word. I mean, that's, that's what love does. It trusts, it believes the best. We believe in them, but, but we also believe for them. We, we believe for each other. Uh, I want you to remember the story in scripture where the four friends bring that paralyzed individual to Jesus and they do so by cutting a hole in the roof and they lower him in front of Jesus. And scripture tells us that Jesus recognizes the faith of his friends, not the paralyzed man, his friends, and he heals the man. See, sometimes we can't get to Jesus on our own. We need each other. We need friends who will believe in us, and we need friends who will believe for us and take us to Jesus. They can do that in prayer. They can do that with a listening ear. We can do that with listening ears, with prayers, with us loving each other enough, man, to believe the best. 
friends can take us to Jesus. I love that. So love always protects, love always trusts, and here's number three, fill in the blank, love always hopes. This is a joyful hope. It anticipates God's deliverance. This love wants your friends to succeed. I don't see this a lot. Quite honestly, I see sometimes people becoming very jealous of their friends and their accomplishments and their success, but, but true love, man, wants, wants others to succeed. Uh, wants their friends to do well. Uh, if, if, if it's the right kind of hope in you, then you'll get excited about other people's accomplishments. Um, you won't try to make them feel bad about the blessings that they're receiving. See, this hope um, that loves knows how to, and here's a fill in the blank for you, be enthusiastic, you know, be enthusiastic about other people's accomplishments. You're not just hoping the best, but you're, you're hope, you're, you're hope, excuse me, you are hoping for the best, and that hope cuts through discouragement and pessimism and, and, and cynicism of our day. You know you're a real friend when you can rejoice with others' victories. So love protects, love trusts, love hopes, and here's number four, love always perseveres. Always perseveres. It means love has this grit to it. It's gritty. It especially shows up when someone is sick. And, and you know what you do? You make the phone call, you send the email, you visit them at the hospital. Uh, love is tough. It, it knows uh, not to give up when feelings are hurt, when somebody maybe is having a bad day and they're short with you. And, and you know what real love does? It perseveres through that. It doesn't all of a sudden get sensitive and tries to hurt them back. See, love is gritty because your feelings and my feelings, folks, we're, we're all gonna get hurt at times. And someone in this connect group is gonna look at you wrong or say something wrong, but love always perseveres. It's gonna grind, it's gonna grit, it's gonna persevere in this and not let the looks, not let the words, not let the voice tones keep you from loving them. That's what love does, it's powerful. I love what Proverbs says in verse 17, of chapter 17, a friend loves at all times, and a brother is born for adversity. See, a friend will see you through it. Others, man, see you're through, but a friend will see you through it. Some friendships, man, I love the scripture says, some friendships do not last, but some friends are more loyal than brothers. Can I tell you right now, I'm praying for us to be the family that God wants us to be, that our friendships last that you develop uh, friendships that supersede all that's going on around us in our circumstances and our environment. I like how Romans chapter 12, verse 10 puts it. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo, I like that, outdo one another in showing honor. Treat each other like royalty. See, we live in a culture of, that's fearful of commitment but Christ baptized us into a family of commitment, of a family of committed brothers and sisters. Let's not just be believers, let's be belongers. Check out Romans 12, verse five. In Christ, we who are many form one body and each member belongs to all the others. Man, circle that, belongs to all the others. First you commit to Christ, and then you commit yourself to a church family. And the next step you commit to is a small group of Christ followers where there's always protection, there's always hope, there's a spirit of trust, and man, there's a gritty, persevering love. Here's my question for you, and we'll get ready to close out this session of my talk. Can you name one person who knows you, that you're that kind of person? Can you name one person that that you're that friend who would carry them to Jesus? Can you name that one person who you know would say you're that person? I think we can all think of someone in our family, our neighborhood that needs a friend. What if we were to invite them to church or even this connect group? Um, so when you're reflecting on this and, and, and how we can belong with each other, why not invite some people to be part of this? Uh, let's not be an exclusive group. Let's be an inclusive group. Uh, I think it'd be so cool if people could actually experience the DNA and the culture we're trying to create when it comes to belonging with each other. So let me ask you another question. What if you were to invite someone to your connect group? 
Now, if you can think of the name, write it down. Write down their name. And, and make yourself accountable with someone in Connect Group before you leave group tonight. Let them know who that person is that you're gonna to invite to Connect Group or invite to church. I believe God could use that. You know, here's the truth. If I had the cure of cancer, I'd shout it from the mountaintops. Man, I, I'd be passionate, I'd be obnoxious, I wouldn't worry what anybody would think about me. Why? Because I have the cure to cancer. Well, you, you know what? You and I have a greater message to share. We have the cure for humanity's sickness. And I'm not trying to be trite with this. We have the cure to humanity's sickness, to all the hatred going on in our world today. We've got the cure. And, and, and the cure is a person, his name is Jesus. So why not invite people to be around that so they can actually be introduced to Jesus? And hopefully it starts with them seeing our love for one another. One another. You may or may not be aware of this, but the number one reason for people coming to Christ is someone inviting them to church or to be part of a small group where they see the love of Christ in action. That's the number one reason. See, we can't take things with us when we pass away, but we can take people with us if they come to know Jesus. So let's belong with each other, but in the midst of us trying to grow in our belonging with one another, let's try to bring some others in this journey with us. I love you, man. You're gonna go into your discussion time right now. Um, and, and my hope and my prayer is that God will teach us how to practice these four things first on each other, but then also be trying to bring some people along the ride with us. Let me pray for you. Lord, I thank you so much uh, for this Connect Group. Uh, this, man, as we're trying to study what biblical community is, and Lord, that we can, we can try to flesh out love, Man, that it, it, it trusts, it protects. Man, God, that it, 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 it's got this grit to it. Help us take today and the rest of this week to really try to flesh out those four things in the lives of people we come encounter with, the lives of people we interact with in Jesus' name. Thanks, God, for this group. Amen.